Uh, one of the early ones that came up, uh, Kevin, I'd like to ask if you wouldn't reply. Uh, we've had, uh, we were able to highlight John Deere's technology today and I'm very appreciative of their willingness to be here. Uh, but there are others out there that are providing some technologies. Uh, can you share other company names that you're familiar with? Yeah, so this the, field? the two liquid ones that I'm aware of on the market, and fortunately my notes uh, on a lot of these are locked in my office and inaccessible at this point. But uh, <laughs> Bearvent, uh, Vandaloop Equipment Company here out of Wisconsin has one that they've been using for about a year. And John Deere's, uh, both of those are liquid ones that have been on the market for more than a year. Uh, there's a number of companies that are playing with um, the solid manure sensors, but neither of those are on the market yet. And both of them had asked me not to use their names until they were formally ready to launch. But I think one of the key things is with any of these technologies is before you make that investment, look at whether or not it's been accurately calibrated. I know that in uh, some of the early data that John Deere had shared, um, their algorithms for the European manures were similar, but not exact for what we typically see here in the US. And many more samples, particularly of low solids manure had to be gathered because that was where we tended to see more variation. And so uh, making sure that whatever technology that you're going to invest in uh, has been calibrated for the types of manure that you're spreading is important. But like I said in the presentation, knowing what your regulators are going to accept, I would hate to see somebody invest a significant amount of money in a technology only to have the regulatory agency in their state two weeks later say, well, that one doesn't meet our standard. And the technologies I see to date, Kevin, that are being used uh, are, are based on NIR uh, measurements, which we've been using for quite a number of years for in-field measurements of feed analysis. So it's a product we've been able to use both with slurry or liquid and, and dry products. Yep, and the, like I said, the key thing is making sure that they're calibrated and I mean with deer system I know literally you can take that same sensor and put it on the TMR put it on the forage chopper and uh, the algorithm can be calculated for multiple uses and so having technology that can be used across multiple streams uh, definitely helps bring that cost down as well. Uh, folks, if you wish to add questions to the Q&A box, we'll try to get to some of those. Uh, Bergen, I'm going to turn to you next. Uh, you answered a question about the variability that you're on a, on a reasonably regular basis seeing if you were to apply 200 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre. What's the kind of variability that's kind of common? Yeah, and, and what I was saying there is, you know, it's all going to depend on that producer's pit and how well the custom applicator or the producer is agitating. You know, that's that's a hard one to put an answer to without knowing that and a lot of variables that go into having variable manure. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've personally seen it uh, run from, you know, maybe 215 down to 140 in certain instances that we were pumping out of on one particular day. But like I said, you know, that's, that's a hard one to answer, and uh, I really think that's kind of why this technology also helps some of our customers understand how variable it can be, depending on what their current practices are for agitation. Yeah, but I think you dropped in a note to that uh, 5 to 15 percent is not uncommon. I'm guessing you're thinking in terms of slurry manures. In our solid manures, we expect even greater variability than that. And so having that technology eventually available for solid will be even more valuable to us in the high plains. Sure. Any other comments, variability? Yeah, I see a lot of benefit on the solid manure once that technology is available, particularly because our density varies so much. I mean, the, the stuff I've seen out of Canada and the United States companies here that have integrated those load cells with density sensing and able to change the spinner speed for the poultry manure, able to change the beater speed and everything else for the beef manure. Um, I think it's really gonna be a game changer for a variable rate application and getting the right amount in the right place at the right time. 
Craig, you uh, had a, a new question that just was added. I think I'll jump into that. And it's a hard one, probably not a good answer, but uh, in today's economic environment, what are the economies of scale for this technology? Is do you know anything about a cost of return per acre or where it's going to work the best? Anybody want to tackle that at all? So <laughs> I think that I'll let Bergen talk specifically about the Harvest Lab because that's the one example where we've got some financial numbers. But I think a part of it is really looking at what system you already have. So if you already have a compatible uh, tractor speed integration system with the um, system that you're putting on for nutrient sensing, obviously that makes much more economic sense versus, well, in order to make this work, I've got to buy a brand new tractor or I've got to upgrade my current system. And so that's one of the reasons I talked a little bit about that low cost mapping system that's out there in that for some folks starting off with just some of the basics may be the best step. But Bergen, I'll let you talk about the economics here. Yeah, a thing I'll add to that question, I guess, is um, all this technology does cost something. And uh, so I think if the producers really need to uh, work with their trusted advisors to determine what kind of technology can benefit their operation on their manure application, if it's helping them apply a more consistent rate of a certain nutrient on their ground that'll benefit them and maybe reduce their uh, chemical costs down the road that season. The other thing I'd add too is um, with our sensor, um, you can use it on multiple applications. So we have customers today that already have a forage harvester with a Harvest Lab 3000 on it that also pump their own manure. And so once they're done shopping, depending on how the season works out, you know, they can take that sensor off and put it on their um, drag line application unit and kind of get, and then bring it in the dairy even and run a turntable. So they kind of have one sensor for three uses. So for them, it, it, you know, it might be a easier pill to swallow for the technology cost. Um, you know, it depends on what kind of tractor you got and all that that stuff as well. So I don't really have a direct answer to that question, but it's gonna it's gonna vary on each customer's operation and what they're trying to get. Um, but they they do need to work with a trusted advisor to figure out where they can gain some ROI on the technology um, um, and not and not have a, have a pretty a map. map. Um, one question that was not answered in the Q&A box that I'll bring up here, are there indications or examples of this technology being used at lagoon sites? Uh, they're talking about municipal uh, uh, sites for municipal facilities. Uh, I might ask that in terms of also our lagoons that we use on livestock operations where we can't, we, we don't typically agitate them with the ponds. Uh, and the material is very diluted. Are you seeing it applied for diluter liquids or for irrigation systems? So I think the key, the key thing is, is if I'm using some type, we've got some feedback system here or somebody's. The key thing that I see is that the harvest lab is, or nutrient technologies like this have the most value when used as close to where manure is being applied to the soil as possible. So rather than using it at the load stand for a 6,000 gallon tank going out to the field, uh, I would rather see it on the discharge point of the uh, piece of application equipment to get that accurate as applied uh, mapping data. And I'll, Bergen, I'll let you hit the other part of the question here. Yeah, there, there's, I think there's opportunity for that. The most uh, of the units that we have out today are running um, either pumping hog manure or uh, cattle. Technology is fairly new in its application. I think there's lots of opportunities that not, all that have not been explored. So Ted Funk had one here, um, it's more for Bergen about the resolution of the system um, in terms of being able to adjust the nitrogen rate as you're going across the field. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so right now we just have speed automation to control that application rate uh, from a more or less a prescription capability. And then down the road, 
we hope to have integration with a rate controller to uh, execute uh, kind of more in-depth prescriptions like he was referencing. The other question that I did want to mention too that came up is uh, lab versus Harvest Lab 3000. And is pretty true is uh, we're kind of comparing two different technologies uh, to each other. We're comparing uh, reflectance to a curve and then we're comparing it against wet chemistry. So I think you're gonna see variances in both uh, Harvest Lab 3000 and Aura Lab too. Uh, the lab is always looked at as the trusted source, but we have seen where there is variability between those. So uh, just keep kind of keep that in mind. And then the other part of that question too was uh, what requirements are needed from a calibration standpoint. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Harvest Lab 3000 uh, needs a black and white reference uh, once a year just to keep that sensor in check and making sure that we are reading the nutrients as accurate as possible. And that is a pretty simple process. 